nice to see all of you students here. Thank you for coming out. Um, this is actually what I wanted to say. Uh, my whole life is sort of, you know, sprained from failures. Yeah. You know? Throughout the college, I went. And I majored in city planning. I went to Miami, Ohio. Uh, and after college, I went to New York City, and I got accepted into the executive training program at Macy's Department Store. So I was an assistant buyer, manager, floor manager, actually, in retail at Macy's Department Store. And When I called home and told my mother that I got a job at Macy's, my mother started bragging around town. My boy's running Macy's. <laughs> but after about a year and a half, I got fired. You know, Macy's just didn't think I was sending the towels and the sheets over to the Staten Island store fast enough. So I was fired. So I came back here to Columbus, and I'm thinking in my mind, if I go downtown to Lazarus, and if I apply to the executive to the executive training program at Lazarus, they are surely going to want me because all of the knowledge that I have and all the secrets that I had carried with me from Macy's. But Mrs. Lazarus is here in the room, her family and the store connections, and the man looked at me and he said, retelling is just not in your soul, Will. It's just not. So he knew. He knew. He knew. He knew. And I didn't get hired at Lazarus in department store. <clears throat> and so I went home in this city right here. I was like 23 years old, and I looked in the mirror and I said, okay, Will, you have to now start to focus on your life and your career. What is it that you really want to do? And I love to write. My minor was literature, English literature in college. And so I love to write. So I started writing small newspapers around the country, and I got a job in Charleston, West Virginia, in Pittsburgh. And then I went to the Boston Globe. I became a national correspondent there and a foreign correspondent. While I was at the Boston Globe, one morning I came in and the editor told me that he was sending me up to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst to interview a writer. And I said, okay, cool, who's the writer? And they said, James Baldwin. Okay, you know, the James Baldwin. You know. Legendary James Baldwin. I don't think I slept that night. But the next morning, I got up and got on the train and went up there, and Baldwin was staying in this um, lovely house near the campus. And I said to myself, now at this point, I hadn't written one book, not a single book. And I said to myself, after my interview, I'm going to ask Mr. Baldwin a very personal question. So the interview's over with. And then I'm ready to ask my question. I said, can I ask you a question, Mr. Baldwin? No. He was smoking a cigarette. He said, yeah, baby, go ahead. Ask him anything you want to. Sure, baby. I said, do you think, Mr. Baldwin, that someday I will be able to write books? And he looked at me, and he said, how the hell should I know what you'll be able to do in your life? <laughs> and I'm not you. I have no idea if you'll be able to write books. You know, and I felt so low. I mean, I wanted to, like, run out of that house. And I don't know, maybe he saw how low I felt because he leaned in close to me. And he said, but I'll tell you what, baby. Whatever you do, 
whatever you do in life, you must go the way your blood beats. You must go the way your blood beats. So here I, and so here I am, nine books later. Even when people didn't think I could write books, I knew I was going to follow my blood, how it was beating. So if there's any message that I leave with you today, it's like, you know, if you want to be a cinematographer, a filmmaker, a doctor, a dentist, a teacher, go the way that your blood beats. Those words are on my wall in my writing study in my home in Washington, D.C. Whatever you do in life, you must go the way your blood beats. And that's what I've done. So. I'd like to thank you again for being here, for giving students the opportunity to experience uh, uh, a writer live and in person. Um, and so I, I'm a Columbus native as well. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I'm interested in um, just how you decided to focus on a book on film, and specifically kind of on the 100 year history of black film. What's the story behind that? Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, there was a neighborhood theater here on North High Street. It's still there, but it's something else now. It's called the uh, Garden Theater in the Garden Theater. And I would go there on Sundays, you know, matinee, it was cheap, 50 cents. Quarter to get in and a quarter for my candy. You know, and this was in the 1960s, I was a kid. So I'm looking up at the big screen at movie stars who I loved. It was Charles Bronson, Paul Newman, Robert Redford, Lee Marvin, Elizabeth Taylor, Doris Day, Rock Hudson, John Wayne. They were all white. I never, as a kid, went into the Garden Theater and saw a black leading man or leading woman on screen. And so, Years later, and I write this story about this White House butler, and it becomes a movie with all these amazing stars uh, in it. And I'm down in New Orleans on the film set, and I'm at this soiree with the cast, and I'm looking around, and there's Lee Daniels, there's Oprah Winfrey, there's Jane Fonda, there's, there's Lenny Kravitz, you know, all these stars. And I just said to myself, my goodness, somebody needs to really write about this moment, about this movie where these black and white stars have taken pay cuts because they really wanted to make the movie. And I just said to myself, somebody must capture this. And then Terrence Howard, who is a member of the cast, was standing near me and he walked around to me and, and he said, you're the writer, so you ought to write the book. And I think that the seed was planted right at that moment. So that was back in 2013. But then I was finishing another book, and then another book, and then I earnestly started writing and researching this book in 2017. Okay. Um. So as I tell students, writing is a process. <laughs> it doesn't yep. just happen overnight. Um, is there any role that Columbus, Ohio played in thinking about this book? I know you've written at least two books, Tigerland and The Hagos of Columbus, that, that focus on Columbus. Yeah, the movie, you know. The Garden Theater. The movie theater, you know. It, but then, yeah, you know, because it's, sort of two parts, you know. So I was a kid then, right, in the 60s. And then I went away to college in the 70s. And I would come home in the summertime, and there was a new theater, the Southern Theater, downtown. And the Southern Theater showed black movies. Shaft, Superfly, uh, Truck Turner, you know, all these movies with black, uh, figures in them and 
it was just a very beautiful moment and it was so different from the Garden Theater because you would come out of the Southern Theater, you know, like at 4.30 or 5 o'clock, and you would see this line of people waiting to see the next movie, this line of all black people, mostly. And they were just hungry, very hungry for cinema, you know, very hungry. Even though cinema has been used as a weapon against against blacks for so many years you know you know it's still you know it still is a big a big cultural thing in this country as a foreign correspondent and not land in a foreign country south africa or germany or france and not meet somebody <coughs> and the first thing they would want to talk about would be movies from America, movies from America. So this question is, it's kind of deep, okay, but not too deep. How do you define Her questions black? are deep because she's deep. No, <laughs> I'm working on this. So how do you define black film? Like what, how did you determine you know, what makes the cut? Is it a black cast? Is it a black director? Is it both? Or is it something else? Yeah. Like how do you, how did you <clears throat> decide? Yeah. You know, so often Hollywood, you know, will think it's making a black film, and yet the white characters by the end of the film start to overwhelm those characters who are black. So I think that for the sake of authenticity, a black film is like a raisin in the sun, a black family, a black nuclear family, a mother, a father, you know what I mean? A son, a daughter, a home, you know, where you are vested in who they are. I mean, even today, studies show that, you know, I think 8.5 out of 8.5 out of 10 movies, the leading man or woman in society is still black. Still black. Even today, I think things are definitely going to change because Look at television now. You can go home tonight and you can see a commercial with two people, two adults, and they're married. One is black and one is white. This just started this year. Madison Avenue must have said, boy, look at the Black Panther. So it must have been a lot of white people in the suburbs who went to see the Black Panther. A lot of foreign countries that are mostly white fell in love with the Black Panther. And so I think that Madison Avenue finally opened his eyes and said, you know, the world we live in is a mixed race society. And there have been mixed race couples, you know, years and years and years and years and years and yet the Hollywood studios have been nervous about interracial stories. So that kind of connects to what I want to ask about history. So you write about the film but you kind of interweave it with these really kind of important historical moments, events, the politics, um, and, and you don't always go in chronological order, which I really enjoy. But, yeah. but, but, and so can you talk about um, how you, how you, how you um, organized that, how you structured it, and then why it was important to, to do it that way? Yeah. Uh, you know, this is a hundred year swath. You know, it's a hundred year history. 
Yeah, but it's interesting because when I first started talking about the book, I went to New York to meet with uh, my editor, and I had, you know, I sat down and just as we were starting to eat, and I said, "So, I hope, Peter, that you are as in love with this idea of me writing about 50 years of cinema as I am." And he was looking at the menu, and then he looked up and he said, no, 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 no. I think you ought to do 100 years. Yeah. And he just, he just doubled my workload as a writer, of course, and as a researcher. But in the end, that was right because 100 years, and I knew I wanted to write about, at the end of the book, about what's going on now in America. And so I could start 1915 with this infamous movie, The Birth of a Nation, which is a very racist movie about the aftermath of the Civil War and blacks in office, holding offices in southern states. And there's a feeling in the movie that, I mean, not a feeling, I mean, it's an outright uh, mission on the parts of the whites in the movie uh, who are Klansmen to rescue white women from black men. And so, you know, it was a movie seen by many Southerners with their attitude, all right, this is our revenge. Uh, D.W. Griffith, who made the movie, was a Southerner too. And Southerners still haven't gotten over that they lost the Civil War. Uh, you know, it's just the fact that Soldiers from Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana, Georgia, Texas, Florida tried to destroy this country. It's just a fact. And people try to hide it now, but no. It wasn't over states' rights and it wasn't over, you know, river, river ways. No, it was over black freedom. It was, Lincoln said, okay, okay, if you want war, then we're going to give you war, but people shouldn't own people. And, you know, that's the, you know, that's the great sin about this country, and it's horrible. But you had this movie that came out in 1915, and it played in movie theaters for four years. For four whole years, it was on the marquees. And it was the first movie in this country where blacks banded together to protest the movie. They were arrested, they picketed, they marched. You know, it was a real solid foundation that we're going to protest this movie. And, you know, and it started a movement. And it was, it was, it was very crucial, you know, to the formation of the NAACP in this country and various civil rights organizations. So in, I think in some ways, many black films in some way are, are almost like talking back to Birth of a Nation. And so it's, it's always just sort of they are haunting us and our imaginary. Yes. yes. But can you talk about Oscar Michelle? Um, so I think not as many people are familiar um, with that era, and he would be like a, a forefather of black film. Mm -hmm. And can you kind of situate him in that history a little bit for us? Yes. Uh, he was a filmmaker. Uh, and he got his start because he went west to South Dakota. His bravery is astonishing. <laughs> I mean, this black man went to South Dakota with the Homestead Act, which Lincoln signed, the Homestead Act on the day that he freed slaves. And the Homestead Act basically was this. If you go out west and you farm 
land and the government will let you have that land after like two or three years. So he, his thinking was, well, I'll go out here and I'll become a farmer and I'll make some money and then I'll go into business, some kind of business. But he, you know, is very lonely out there. He was by himself and he started writing books and novels about his life on the farm. And then he said to himself, hell, this evil movie happens to be playing all around the West in the South. Griffiths, Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Oscar Michaud said, maybe I'll try to track down some people and raise some money and turn one of my books into a movie. <clears throat> and so he did, and it just grew from there. I mean, he really had no forerunner. He really created this movement of black cinema. Uh, it is just an astonishing uh, story. Uh, you know, he ended up making about 40 movies, some silent movies he started during the silent air, and then he started making talkies. Um, you know, he would go from town to town, he would find black actors, actresses who had talent, who had skill, who wanted to be in his films, and he would just make the films. It is amazing. Now, some of his films have gotten lost in history, and some are considered genuine classics. So a lot of people don't know, uh, you know, about him. There's a former faculty member who was here who's written uh, some wonderful books about him. Ron Green, Green, Ron Green, Green is his last name Green Green, right? It always confuses me in his email. Maybe with an I mean, but there's two Greens, right? attached to his name. I don't know. He'll probably see this oh. video and he'll <laughs> say, yeah, you know. His email says, Ron Green Green. I'm just trying to figure out that, if it's two greens attached to his name. There isn't a hyphen either, but anyway. So. Um, He's a great filmmaker. I, I, he was here when I first came to OSU, and he um, retired, so I didn't really get to meet him. Yeah, I mean, when I say it, great filmmaker I'm talking about, oh, Oscar right, Michaud, right, right. not Ron. Well, okay, so Michaud sort of um, was kind of grassroots, um, ushered in an, an era for black filmmaking. Um, and then fast forward to 70s, Melvin and People, yeah. who recently passed. Um, I didn't know until I read your um, kind of eulogy for him that that he went to Ohio Wesleyan University, which is not very far from here. Yeah. Um, but can you kind of talk about the way in which he kind of launches a, a, a whole new kind of black cinema? Yeah. yeah. Melvin Van Peoples made a movie called uh, Watermelon Man for the studio and it made a lot of money. So if you make a movie for the studio and it makes money, the studio is going to ask you, what do you want to do next? And so uh, Melvin Van People said, you know, I think I want to make this movie about a black pimp who sleeps with a lot of women who happen to be white and he stages a revolution <coughs> against police brutality in the midst of all of this. So you can imagine the white white studio chiefs looking at him saying, get the you know what out of my office. You know, and so Melvin Van Peoples was determined to make this movie. He thought it could be special. And so he said to himself, 
I'm going to have to pull an Oscar Michaud. Oscar Michaud went hat in hand, raised money. Hey, if you put $50 into my movie, and if it makes money on the other end, then I might be able to bring you back $300. You know, and that's how he stayed in business. He was raising money to make his movie, and when his movie did good at the box office, he could pay these people back. And so Melvin Van Peoples started saying to himself, okay, in order for me to get $500,000, I'm gonna have to go around to borrow money from folks. And so he went and borrowed money from friends of his. You know, some slammed the door. No, nah, Melvin, I ain't giving you my hard earned money to make no crazy movie about no black pimp. What's the matter with you, man? And, you know, he eventually had enough. He raised $500,000. And he shot the movie. He got a distributor. The major studios wanted nothing to do with him. It only opened in two cities, Detroit and Atlanta. Word of mouth was explosive. And the lines were around the corner. Everybody likes to make money. So the, the two theater owners in these two cities started calling other theater owners and said, hey, folks want to see this movie, this Melvin Van Peoples movie. You really should book it into your theater. <laughs> and so they started to book it, and it just exploded. Uh, the theme track music was by this group that no one had ever heard of. I'm curious to see how many of you have heard of Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> okay. You know, so they made the soundtrack, you know, and this was their first album and their first soundtrack too, you know, and it became this phenomenal, phenomenal hit. An independent movie made for $500,000, grossed more than $15 million. So that's a huge profit margin, huge. And, you know, and it gave a lot of other young black filmmakers the inspiration and the courage to go make their own films. And out of that world came people like uh, Spike Lee. Raising your own money. Lee Daniels, who directed The Butler. This is so sad. One studio, one studio got in touch with me and he wanted to buy the rights to the story, so they did. But then after a year, the option ran out and they didn't renew it. And then Laura Ziskin, who made the Spider-Man movies, uh, she still held the option, but the studio didn't want anything to do with it. So Laura Ziskin went to Sheila Johnson, who was the co-founder of BET, and said, Miss Johnson, this is a heck of a story. It's about this butler who worked in the White House for 35 <laughs> years married to his wife for 65 years, and he lived to see the first African-American president elected. And the butler got invited to the swearing in. So did I, he and I went on the same day. It was just beyond touching, it was so poignant. And, you know, and then he died 15 months later. He died, and his wife had died uh, on the day that Obama was elected. A very sad story. But anyway, so Laura Ziskin stuck with it, went to get Sheila Johnson, and they both went and got NBA players, business people. They went to 40 business people and raised the money to make the movie. When the Hollywood studios didn't want it, they didn't want it. 
the star of the movie was a black man. So they didn't want it. Lee Daniels said, we got to keep pushing. I remember one day sitting in my house in Washington, D.C. Lee Daniels called me and said, Will, we're almost there. We almost got enough money to start filming this movie. Now, so let me ask you, Will, if you have $50,000 to spare? And I said, ah, Lee, I wish I did, but no, I don't have no $50,000. I just hung up the phone and I said to myself, well, it's never going to get made. I mean, you know, looks like we're $50,000 short. <laughs> The movie's never going to get made. And so then things got quiet for a whole year. Then I get a phone call. And one of the producers said, says, Will, we found the actress who's going to play the butler, uh, uh, who's going to play the butler's wife. And I said, my goodness, is it still going to be made? Because I haven't heard from anybody in a whole year. And she said, well, Will, that's just the way Hollywood works, but of course, we're still making the movie. And I want to tell you who's going to play the wife of the butler. And I said, great, who is it? And it's Pam Williams, who I was talking to. She said, Oprah Winfrey. And I said, all right, Pam, stop kidding now. Really, who's going to play the wife of the butler? And she said, no, no, Will, uh, I am very, very serious. Oprah Winfrey just signed to play the wife of the butler. And I could hardly sleep that night. I mean, I, I said, wow, you know. And then she called me back two days later and said, we finally got the butler signed. We finally have it signed. I said, who's going to play the butler? And she said, Forrest Whitaker. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, it's, you know, this kind of seems like some kind of joke. Now, bam, you know, you got Oprah Winfrey who hasn't acted in a movie in like, 14 years and now she, you know she's coming out of semi uh, retirement from the screen to act in a movie based on a story that little old me wrote and she said well I gotta tell you who else we got too Mariah Carey, Lenny Kravitz, Robin Williams, Vanessa Redgrave, Jane Fonda you know and so that's what happened. They got me. But they had to raise the money. In the movie, when it opened, number one at the box office. The second week, number one at the box office. The third week, number one at the box office. The first 10 weeks in the top 10 of the box office. Went overseas in China, in Japan, in France, in Germany, South Africa, selling out at the box office. But the people who ran the studios couldn't, couldn't see that. They couldn't see that you all would want to see a movie about this amazing man and his story. And I proudly say it's a black movie. It didn't focus on the eight white presidents, which some of the, some of the directors who called me said that they were going to focus on that, you know, and I knew I wasn't going down the road with them. But Laura Ziskin said, I promise you, what I'll do, I'll make sure that this story is centered on the butler. And she was true to her word, and that's what happened. I think that's why the film was a success. It's also a lesson in immediate gratification. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. having to, keep pers uh, to persevere, to be determined. Yeah. So I, I don't know if we have too much time, but I want to... Yeah, I can't see that far, Jira. Without my glasses. So it's 119, so I don't know if we would have a couple questions. Or if we have more. Sure, if there are folks. I mean, you you finish? Finish, Dr. Good. Drake? If you're not, we can take some questions. Then. Totally no, up to I, you. We can see if there's questions. If not, I'll ask a couple more. Hello. Hi. Um, one of the, the areas that I like um, in American history is um, American literature, anyway. the Great Migration. Oh, yes. Uh, 
Yeah. What what particular film from any of that good writing came out of that? I haven't read the book, but I will. But I was wondering what if a, if there are any particular films that came out of that good writing, the good vibration. Yes, all under the filmmaker Oscar Michel. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question? Gee, what kind of um? films kind of came out of like writing around the Great Migration? You know, the 1930s, mm -hmm. 19, you know, the whole decade. The only black filmmaker who was consistently working then, and it was Oscar Michel. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. Where do you rate? I'm sorry. Where do you rate um, films like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? With uh, like Sidney Poitier. Yeah. And yeah. Are they plays that that is, um, <clears throat> Drake asks? Are they black films or how do you do that? Because the major actors in there are black, but right. it's not particularly a black film, is it? You know, it's a film. You know, which you know, with each year and that rolls by and it becomes harder and harder to watch. Mm -hmm. It does. But at the time it was made, nineteen sixty seven, mm -hmm. and it was considered, you know, very groundbreaking in a way. You know, it's a, you know, for you know, those of you who haven't seen it, it's about a white lady uh, who is getting ready to marry a highly overrated magical <laughs> Negro. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, she's not on his level by any stretch of the imagination. She's just an ordinary uh, white lady. But the Hollywood figures said, "Well, that's what it takes to capture her. It takes a Superman of a Negro." You know, and that movie was considered groundbreaking, and you know, so it's harder and harder, uh, you know, to to watch. Uh, there is a, there's a quote in the book from the lady who played, you know, the white lady who's getting ready to marry. And the black man, Sydney Portier, and uh, she says it was hard on the movie set. It was just hard, and they filmed in a so-called liberal city, San Francisco. And she said it was just hard for white citizens to watch me and Sydney hugging or whatever in the movie. And it's just one kiss, just. One little peck, one little peck, you know, between the black man and the white woman. And that was considered revolutionary. That was considered like epic, you know, wow, did you see that? I have a story about that. Here's one right here. Wait a minute. She, by the way, this student right here, by the way, <laughs> recognized more of the characters on the book jacket than <laughs> all of the other students at the table with me having lunch. <laughs> and so she knows her film history. I was impressed. Okay, your question. Um, you know what, uh, and I feel fortunate, my editor uh, in New York, he's white, you know, but he's one of the most woke people you'll ever meet, you know, he's just woke, you know, he's, you know, he's hip, you know, he knows what's going on, he's just woke, you know, 
know, and so I, you know, I think, you know, folks like good, you know, good storytelling. Any editor loves good storytelling. Any studio chief loves good storytelling. They just do. If you bring them something that has some meat on the bones, you know, they'll hop to it. You know, so when I wanted to do this book, you know, I did it, you know, because I figured it was a story, you know, that hadn't been written yet. And so, and the film rights to that book have just been sold, just sold them, so that's nice. Question. Yes. Um, are you writing anything or working on anything um, currently? Can we expect anything from you soon, like film wise or uh, literature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice question. Uh, Lee Daniels directed The Butler. He's making a mini series out of my Sammy Davis Jr. book. So, fingers crossed, you know, it could. It could reach the screens next year. You know. It's going to be on the small screen, not at the movie theaters. It's going to be like a five-part miniseries. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Will it be like on one of the streaming platforms? Yes. Yes. I, I know which one, but you know, but I don't think I'm supposed to say it right now. <laughs> you all will hear about it though very, very shortly. Lee has written the first. Know, uh, script and it's, it's just stunning. I just saw it not long ago. So. Well, connected with that, I, I just, okay, go ahead. Who's that? Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how crazy. I, um, so, as uh, like other black filmmakers and uh, black creators come up to the game nowadays, like want to like innovate the game or whatever, but like, obviously, uh, I think it's still like important to like obviously. Do our research and like trying to pick that into the past, you know, like like, uh, like great from back then. So, would you recommend any like, like like literature or like authors that like could uh, like help with like creating our own stories? Um, like be it like James Baldwin or um, yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, read August Wilson. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Read Chester Himes, read uh, uh, Lorraine Hansberry. You know, if you start with those three, you know, it's going to open, you know, a lot of doors. How you spell the last one? Um, Hansberry, H A N E S B E R R Y. She was the one who wrote the play, A Raisin in the Sun, which starred Sidney Poitier on Broadway, and then and then it was made into a movie. Cindy Portier starred in the movie. She died young. It's you know, very tragic, but she was just absolutely brilliant. There's a lot about her in the book, too. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are these kind of like, uh, like synonymous with like film as well, too, or like the locals offer specifically? Like All three of those people who I mentioned are linked to filmmaking. All three of them. Um, I don't know if there's a question, but I wanted to bring, the reason why I'm asking this is to kind of expand students' minds to what else goes around filmmaking. Yeah. Um, so I'm a lawyer by degree. So something that has stood out to me several times is I hear IP rights. I hear, you know, when you're talking about, oh, you can't really say this right now because you're waiting, you know, for clearance on certain things. So that's just something to keep your eyes out of like all the other aspects of the industry for the students. But my question centers around the IP rights and how that translates to some level of equity to the people who are, whose life stories are actually the center of what is being portrayed. I've always kind of wondered, and this kind of came up, it wasn't a, what did it turn into a movie? I think The Life of Henrietta Lacks. Yep, yep. That was a question. Yep. So if you could just speak to that, how how you handled it, or how you think it should be handled? Yeah, yes. Uh, you know, so say if Hollywood wants to make somebody, you know, if Hollywood wants to make a movie, 
about somebody who's still living, then Hollywood often finds that person and then they have them sign their life rights over to the studio so that when and if the movie comes out, that person can't say, hey, I, I didn't really want you to put that in the, in the movie, so I'm going to sue you because I'm bad, because I'm mad. But Hollywood can say, well, wait a minute now. You signed your life rights over to us. So that gave us the right to make the kind of movie that we wanted to make. You know, and so with the butler, he was still living when my story came out. And so Hollywood bought the rights to my story and bought his life rights also. And so that's how it happened. Now, Hollywood can go and make a movie about you or you or you or you, and if there's nothing wickedly false about that movie, then it just gets made. I mean, you know, several rock and roll people Rock and roll singers have had movies made about their lives and didn't really want those movies made. You know, however, the filmmaker had enough uh, had enough passion and that they wanted to make the movie. Yes, sir. While you were writing this book, <laughs> did you discover any really great movies that most people have never heard of that you'd recommend for us to give a watch? Yeah, you know, there's one that just blew my mind, and it was came out in 1933, and it was with uh, Barbara Stanwyck and uh, Teresa Harris, uh, who's black. Stanwyck is white. Mm -hmm. It's a movie about uh, two people, two women in the 1930s, by the way, in the 1930s, who are friends, mm -hmm. just like ordinary, ordinary black and white friends. They're just friends. And it's, you know, it's a movie that, you know, really shocked me because, you know, it got in right under the wire of this law called the Hayes Code. In the Hayes Code, they didn't want blacks and whites hugging each other on screen or hanging out together or forming any kind of a bond. And uh, you know, can somebody, can somebody hand me the book? I want to tell you the title. It's right on the tip of my tongue. The title of this, uh, title of this movie with Teresa Harris. I'm going to tell you because I want. You know, and I think it's on uh, YouTube. What'd you say? Yeah, yeah, you can get it. Okay, I'm gonna tell you right now the title of the movie. Go to page 94. The title. Oh, one Okay, the title of the movie is. Uh, baby face, baby face, baby face. Uh, uh, in 1933. Uh, Let me read you, since I haven't done any reading, I'll read you a little bit, one paragraph, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, now I think I can talk pretty loud. If you were a Negro citizen of the United States in the latter half of 1933 and got all dressed up to go out to the movie theater. One of the movies that would have likely caught your attention was Babyface. It starred Barbara Stanwyck and George Brent. However, to Negroes, the real star of the movie 
was Teresa Harris, who played Chico. Chico was best buddy to Lily Powers, the Stanwick character, and just like Lily, a street prostitute. No matter their moral positions in life, Chico and Lily were one of the first more honest black-white friendships to be showcased on a major motion picture screen. They were equals. And the reality of this at the time was its own kind of shock. I mean, you know, and when I saw that movie, you know, it was just a stunner, you know. And it explains, you know, Stanwick's life. Stanwick was a real liberal in her life, you know. And she treated people decently, no matter their racial background. She was a beautiful person, Barbara Stanwyck. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.